from a presentation that benefits by access to big data. This finesses well into our next presentation from Australia Townsville, where I did my PhD. Michael Bradley is working there and talking to the critical issue in our times of big data, which is data integration for actionable knowledge using machine learning. Hi, my name is Michael Bradley. I'm a fish ecologist, and I'm here to talk to you about our group, Marine Data Tech, JCU. I'll give you a, an overview of who we are and what we do and what we'd like to work on in the future. So we're a group that focuses on marine problems, usually biology and ecology problems in the marine environment. We use advances in data science and advances in technology. And we're a hub because we're a central node within our College of Science and Engineering at James Cook University. Uh, we bring together a diverse group of people. And we're really all about creating actionable knowledge. So not just using uh, advances in technology to produce new information, but producing information that's robust, that's useful uh, to take actions in the real world, such as managing marine ecosystems. We bring together the combined expertise of a range of uh, ecologists, biologists, fishery scientists, biostatisticians. Uh, and the group is nominally led by these these individuals and we connect and work with a range of information technology, uh, Internet of Things, data science and engineering uh, experts. So uh, all up a, a large group of both professorial and senior academic staff and we bring this expertise to bear on applied problems in the marine realm. So our role is really about innovation, making sure that innovations in the IT space and spaces like IT move across and help ecologists, biologists, and fishery scientists do their jobs even better. So this is a Google Earth overview of the kind of sampling that we do. So each of those little arrows is a underwater video. Um, so we put out thousands of underwater video uh, samples across this landscape. So going from islands, to coastal areas, to estuaries and rivers, uh, in the rainforests and mountains of tropical North Queensland. So this is an example of the kind of projects that I carry out as a, as a fish ecologist, fishery scientist. Um, and this data helps us understand the, the habitats and resources that fish need to complete their life cycles and also allows us to monitor fish and fisheries and s monitor their health over time uh, and look for any declines in, in populations. And this is what one of those samples looks like. This is the underwater footage we get. Uh, so this technique is great, but there's still a few major impediments to using this technique broadly uh, across the fishery science and fish monitoring space. One of the main impediments is the sheer volume of footage that you end up with. While we like to take thousands of samples, produce really robust data, uh, we end up with a huge amount of sample processing time. So that's one of the first issues we tackled as a group, um, was trying to remove this sample processing time burden. Uh, and so we've developed an AI that's capable of removing fish, removing frames from the video that don't have fish in them. Um, which is empty data for us. So here you're watching the 10 second highlight reel of a 30 minute video sample. Um, so we've been able to process that, that video footage much faster. The AI we developed for this is very broad. It's capable of rec recognizing a broad range of fish species and it simply recognizes that there's a fish in the frame and then presents uh, that footage to us for analysis. The great thing with AI is you can peel back the curtain and actually see what that AI is picking up on, how it's recognizing a uh, fish. Um, we can go as far as training AIs that recognize specific life stages of specific species. Uh, so we've developed an AI for recognizing the juveniles of this adult mangrove jack. And this is a major, another major issue that AI can solve 
uh, in using this technique. So we end up with uh, consistent species identification rather than uh, the observer bias that comes in when using human viewers and, and especially when using a range of different human viewers to process footage that might have different biases. So there's always going to be bias even when using AI to process footage. Uh, the difference is you can look at that bias, understand it, quantify it, uh, and then account for it. Here's an example of our AI picking up a juvenile mangrove jack in this footage. Uh, so we're able to process large volumes of footage looking for this one species and it's usually able to perform even better than a human viewer. As you can see, the species can be quite cryptic and hard to see. And there are a range of other things you can do uh, to advance the use of video uh, for fish monitoring, uh, such as counting, automatically counting uh, fish. Um, what we've done is we've taken the footage we use to make these these networks and made them publicly available. So that, that is now a publicly available image library um, known as DeepFish and it's a realistic image library. So it's footage that is from these difficult environments to work in um, in the marine environment, a, a diverse set of conditions, a diverse set of fish species and lots of movement uh, in the water. So this is publicly available on GitHub, this image library, um, and we're hoping that it can be used by others to train and test models for how they will actually operate uh, when used in the field for fish monitoring. It encompasses a range of environments from mangroves to reefs, seagrass, kelp beds, um, those, those typical environments of nearshore coastal uh, waters. Our key needs for progress in this space are sort of two-pronged. Um, we would like AIs capable of recognizing the whole suite of diversity of fish species uh, that occur in the environments that we work in, and that can be up to 2,500 different species. Um, and on the other hand, we need simple AI that can operate on low-powered devices. Uh, my colleague, Kurt, uh, will take you through one of our projects uh, using AI on mobile devices, which at the moment uh, have to be, those images have to be processed in the cloud, whereas ideally uh, we can create powerful AIs um, that are housed within the mobile device itself. Um, another application for simple AI is the uh, enabling of AI within the monitoring device, the actual device we put under the water. So at the moment, uh, you, we go from a camera that takes video to stored video and we process that stored video uh, with an AI on a GPU in the office. Uh, we've been developing cameras that take the footage straight to an AI, that AI sorts the footage and then only stores the important bits of video, those, those highlight reels that I was showing you before. And this drastically increases the capacity of these devices, so instead of only being able to put these monitoring devices down for an hour. We can now put them down for something like 16 hours. Um, and this is a really exciting space uh, to be working at actually improving the technology um, and improving our capacity to monitor these environments for fish. So thank you all uh, very much. I'll be keen to take any further questions. Thanks very much, Michael. And. Uh... As anyone who deals with big data before knows, it's, it's not easy. I mean, even to run this event, getting all the videos and making sure that they have been moved between drives and, and, and ready for Ricardo to use was a task. And that, that's just 30 or 40 videos. So it's great to see people working on the bigger questions of big data, such as what uh, Michael's team is doing, where they're taking us away from place-based data and, and starting to develop systems-based data where they're following from range to reef and using information, trying to integrate that. So you can imagine the, the, the challenges that come. And I think that that's where my question comes to you. What were your major challenges in dealing with your big data? 
And then secondly, give us a little bit of an indication where when we started to, for example, do the Shark Beta app, which went onto a phone, the design of the app, which you would imagine would be something that you could sort of do a picture board, storyboard, and then get it written up in code, was actually quite complex, much more complex than you can imagine, because it has to be intuitive to the user, but it also has to enable some of the technology behind it. So whether they're going to capture images and work on it later when they have internet access, or as you pointed out, some simplified mechanism. Just give us some ideas, Michael, of the back, backroom conversations you've had going from a place-based video to a systems-based video and how to move such big data and how you have struggled or, or what kind of avenues you've taken for thinking about how we develop these user-based apps that people are going to hold in their hands. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. Um, that's a great question. And I, I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this conversation. Uh, I think my experience has been um, over the past few years, moving from a, a solo researcher who would carry out my particular project uh, to working with a large team. Uh, and in doing that, um, finding that those connections and collaborations are really vital to solving all these challenges. So I'm an ecologist. I don't have the expertise to, to handle a, a lot of the different problems that face that face us. Uh, and so in, in, in working with a, a range of different experts, I think that's, that's been really, really critical. Um, so, so working with engineers, um, working with IT professionals, this has been, um, the, the, the key thing that our group has done is, is connecting these people together to, to have these conversations. Uh, so I guess in answer to your question, um, yeah, we've, we've moved from moving things around on, on large hard drives and sending, sending you know, hard drives in the post across uh, countries um, to, to trying to uh, thin down what needs to be sent uh, and then shifting it up to the cloud. So at the moment, we're working with a, a phone-based application for monitoring um, market fish species across the Pacific. Uh, and something that's been really critical in those um, in, in that uh, project is allowing data to move from the mobile device back to our servers um, in tiny, tiny packets. And so I'm not a software engineer, uh, so I haven't been involved in doing the, the nitty gritty of that, but it's been a key innovation is to allow this data to trickle through uh, in small packets under low connectivity um, circumstances rather than waiting to, to put it all on a big drive and then wait months for it to end up in the right place in the right country to do that processing. Thank you. Matt, do you have a question for Michael? Yeah, I, I, um, fantastic work, Michael, and a really sort of broad spectrum that you're covering there with your presentation of, of from mobile apps to IoT underwater. And I think it's important to highlight, isn't it, the, the, the low cost of a lot of that IoT technology uh, and a, you know, a simple Arduino board or Raspberry Pi perhaps with a, a, a camera attached to it uh, and how accessible that is uh, for anybody with a bit of technical knowledge, in fact, to download some code. Um, do you have any plans on, on, on developing that also to be to be accessible and be nice if there could be like a how to somewhere online, you know, build something like that if people were interested. Yeah, certainly. So that um, that particular example uh, has been published um, as, a, as a sort of a how to guide. Um, so that's how to build that camera uh, with the Raspberry Pi setup. Um, it, it wasn't work that I led myself. So I'll, I'll be able to share that um, that paper with anyone who's interested. Um, yeah, that's that's really our vision um, to go to, to bring these technologies and then turn them into methods. You know, peer-reviewed, um, understood methods in ecology um, and in, in fishery science. So to make that translation. The really interesting um, uh, presentation this afternoon um, with uh, Dr. Giampaolo Coro from CNR, um, it's worth watching. He covers uh, an IoT uh, devices underwater project that I worked on with him, so I would say it was interesting, wouldn't I? Um, but we're now covering 360 degrees and sizing fish on the fly uh, with, with uh, prototypes that can last weeks. 
uh, and, and you know, considering the data that they're gathering, the cost is, you know, pretty reasonable to be honest. Ah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's incredible what you can do. And I think, yeah, just to reiterate that, um, I think we really need, you know, we need the right people in the right places um, in this coll big collaboration between groups uh, to make sure that. The IT is being performed in a way that, that fulfills the needs of, of um, the ecologists and and their sort of uh, needs for rigor and, and particular um, scientific method. So I think that conversation is just a, a really, really exciting back and forth to, to hone in on these cheap, uh, useful uh, methods that can be used uh, across the world. Yeah.